Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome again to Expire with Prof Neo. Um, yesterday we had a very good episode with Go Wei Jiang on 3D printing and uh, advanced robotics. Today we're going to cover advanced robotics. Now this episode is brought to you by the collaboration and the partnership of Science Centre Singapore, the Singapore Institute of Technology. Now, a lot of people was asking me after yesterday's sessions and they say, why expire? Well, I don't know, but it comes from expiring. And actually, if you look at our logo and you see this red color uh, letter, S-I-E. What does it stand for? STEM, or you can call it science. STEM stands for Science, Engineering, Technology, S-E-T-M, and Mathematics, right? So, so STEM, STEM, I for innovation, and E for entrepreneurship. And that's how we package this into Expire. Hopeful, hopefully that we can give you the aspiration and aspiring to join our world of uh, deep tech or deep technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. All right, so today we are going to advanced robotics. Very interesting, right? 3D printing, advanced robotics, and we're going to bring you the science as usual. The science behind the robots, the innovations, the problems you want to solve, and then the entrepreneurship, right? Which market are we going to disrupt? And, and hopefully, we can bring you and inspire you to aspire to be in the STEM area and have a STEM career or STEM education. All right, so let's move to see Dr. Dr. Tan, and I will move on over, over to there. All right, everybody, this is uh, Dr. Tan Yan Zi, okay? His name is over there, co-founder and CTO of Richbot. And I'm going to address you as Yan Zi, right? So Yan Zi founded a company called Richbot, right? So what is Richbot? Okay, well, let him explain, but let's look at what he do. Okay, responsible for leading technological development. Very, very big words, right? But actually a lot of small little things that accumulated in. Believes that a simple solution is often the most beautiful but hardest to achieve in engineering. Now, who coined this sentence called simplicity is the ultimate complexity, all right? We engineers, you know, have always think about problem solving. But the most elegant engineer will solve problems in a very unique way, which is to focus on customers, empathy, customer experience, make the customer uh, being able to solve problems or, or to have a good experience, right? Just look at the remote control, right? How many buttons are there in the remote controls? I wouldn't know, and I never go and count, but maybe about 25 buttons, and then somebody say, okay, we need to have Netflix, so we put a Netflix button. Somebody say, YouTube, we put a YouTube button. Maybe we have Aspire button, right? So is that the way to solve a problem, right? So really, if you look at the buttons on your remote controls, most of the times you never use it, right? You only use about maybe three buttons. One is called power on off, one is called volume up down, one is called channel up down, and that's about it. But the rest of the buttons, what are they for? Don't know, because we engineers keep putting in, in right? So, so our engineering minds have to change to keep on or keep track with design, which is understanding customers. And this is what we call empathy in design thinking. And this is where I believe Yen Zi has really believed in a lot called simple solution. It's the most elegant. And of course, Steve Jobs say, simplicity is the ultimate complexity. All right. And, well, he got a PhD from NUS, and I think, and uh, this is, this has got, got to be a very smart guy, right? Bachelor of Engineering, first class in electrical engineering, right? So, he and me share the, almost the same background. I'm also an electrical engineer, but I'm not first class. I'm somehow upper class, maybe higher than him, right? He first class, I upper class. Okay, so uh, I will let Yen Tzu uh, carry on with uh, what are you doing, right? So you may have some PowerPoint, some slides, and great stuff here. 
Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks for having me here, Prof Neil, and thank you for the very nice introduction. So I first uh, talk a bit about my background. Okay. <coughs> so actually, I realized that <coughs> my STEM education, my interest in STEM, which started uh, since my secondary school days. So back then, I was in the innovation program, and um, <coughs> it requires me to um, solve a particular problem uh, via the engineering way, like um, coming up with a mechanism, and there's a problem, how, how do you go about solving it? So I was trained in that area. And um, I was also in my CCA, um, I was also involved in the Singapore Youth Flying Club. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to fly the real plane. I was just um, learning how to um, learning how planes fly and building model aircrafts that actually do fly. So that was actually a very enjoyable time period for me. And so when it comes to uh, choosing a course for my uh, bachelor, so it became kind of like natural for me since I have this interest in science and mathematics, STEM, since young, uh, it becomes a natural thing for me to choose engineering. And I went on to NUS engineering and uh, of all the engineering, why did I particularly choose um, electrical and computer engineering? Actually, this is uh, my, so this is my personal take uh, so what I experienced back then uh, during my innovation program was that uh, at that time I didn't know how to uh, like program the computer chips and make it automated. So my solution to the problem is always mechanical based. And uh, through this innovation program, actually uh, I got exposure, I got to visit and see projects in the polytechnics. So when I went to the polytechnics and looked at the projects, especially those from the electrical and computer computer engineering, I was like, wow, this is so, their, their projects are so much more interesting. Like, uh, they actually, the projects there, they move on their own, it's automated. So I got interested in it. And then at that time, back then, um, Singapore was having this uh, train, first line whereby the MRD train is actually driverless. So I think that um, electrical and computer engineering automation is the way to go in future. And that's why I chose to uh, major in ele electrical and computer engineering. And then um, when I got my degree, at that time my final year project, uh, I have a project supervisor. So she encouraged me to, uh, she saw my interest and my ability, so she encouraged me to um, go and do a PhD to further on my studies. So um, based on my interest, and that's why I went on to uh, do a PhD as well. So the pictures, there are three pictures below the slides. So these are uh, some of the uh, systems and projects, robots that I've worked uh, on in the past. So back then, uh, during my PhD, I was actually working on uh, the left picture. It's actually a hard disk drive. Um, if you open up the mechanical hard disk drive, uh, not the solid state one nowadays. <laughs> now, uh, back then there wasn't solid state yet. So this is what you see. It has got an actuator to position the read write head of the um, to position the read write head onto the disk. So it's a bit like um, <coughs> those audio files. They will like to listen to those vinyl records on a gramophone. Yeah. Although I personally never used a gramophone before, but that was how the hard disk drive came about. <laughs> uh, they place a needle on the vinyl record and it will produce music. So this hard disk drive is the same uh, fundamentals of placing the head on the disk to, um, to, to get your data and to write data to it. So um, I was in specializing in control and automation, so this is like um, at that time, everybody wants to use this as a test platform for their algorithms. Because controlling this, uh, there's a saying in the industry, is as though uh, this head flying over the disk, is as though a Boeing plane flying over the Earth's surface at less than one centimeter away from the ground at the speed of light. So this is how close and how fast the read-write head of the hard disk drive is actually flying onto the, this surface. 
if you don't control it well, anything goes wrong, it will just crash onto the this, your data is gone. Yeah. So after I got my PhD, I joined the Keppel NUS corporate lab um, mm -hmm. to work on robotics and the project was about um, coming up with robotic solutions to uh, solve, to improve the productivity of um, the shipyard, some of the uh, operations. So I was working on this, uh, the middle picture is actually a huge, big robot arm um, that are usually, this you don't see them running around, they are only, uh, you only see them in factories, especially uh, mainly the manufacturing uh, lines. So this is a welding robot. Um, when the, this welding robot uh, can only do, it's more for uh, doing um, straight line welding. So welding is a process of um, joining metals together. So what happens is that um, you need to pass very high electric current through. So with this high electric current, it generates a lot of heat. The heat melts the metal and the metals get joined together. So this is the uh, very brief basic uh, explanation of welding. So this robot can only do straight line, for the commercial product can only do straight line. So what happens is um, they require this robot to do, um, to join pipes. So uh, reconfiguring robot to actually, um, for another task as of now, is still not that simple. Yeah, that's why um, there was quite a lot of work done to um, reprogram, to program this robot, install sensors onto it, so that it's able to join uh, thick pipes together. And these pipes are actually those, um, like example, if you know what the jackup uh, rig is. So a jackup rig is a, a huge offshore structure that they um, actually, uh, they have to bring it out to deep sea, deep ocean to actually um, drill for the oil. So these rigs are supported by very strong legs and these are the joints that uh, this robot, uh, back then I was trying to uh, get it to do the welding. And the last picture, the, the, the last picture on the right, that is actually this robot. So this was also from the Keppel NUS corporate lab. And um, <clears throat> the problem for this robot was that um, they want this robot to be able to do um, welding in very small confined spaces. Because now what the workers does is that the workers will have to squeeze into the very confined space to do the welding manually. So it may be a simple box. You want to join the seams inside. But the worker will have to squeeze inside. So with this robot, the worker don't have to squeeze inside to perform all this welding. And welding, um, yeah, it's just it's, uh, using electricity to generate a lot of heat and uh, join the melt the metals and join them together. But with it, it also creates a lot of toxic films. And imagine a small space, the worker go inside, do the welding and breathing in all the films, get exposed to the film, and the temperature inside is very high. So this is the kind of uh, conditions that the workers are working in and this is something that we want to improve. Mm. So, yeah, so let me talk about, so this is how actually Richbox, kind of like how Richbox automation come about. So together with my uh, co-founder and CEO, um, our vision is to provide uh, robotics and AI for a safer and better world. So um, before I go on further, let's see, I have a video to show uh, this robot in action. Mac Richer is also designed for modularity. With onboard batteries and intelligence, it can be controlled by engineers from a safe location to perform wireless visual inspection, enabling immediate detection of defects. Mac Richer is also able to carry out single pass fillet welding of horizontal, vertical, and overhead seams.
Our robots have caught the attention of ministers and higher management of Capo Corporation. With MacReacher, we aim to double the operational efficiency at half the cost and man Okay, so what's so special about this robot is, um, as you can see from the slide, um, it's not just magnets. It's magnetic wheels, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not that simple to just put magnets, stick it there, and then uh, the robot will, will start climbing. So um, we have to very carefully uh, design the magnetic wheel system. Like, uh, so, like this back wheel that you see here. Uh, yeah, so this is actually showing the back of the robot. So it's this wheel system. Of course, the front wheels help the robot to move from a horizontal to a vertical surface to climb the wall. But, um, oops. Okay, so the back wheels here also help with the transition at the very critical moment of transiting from a vertical surface to the ceiling, the overhead surface. So as you can see from this uh, video here, yeah, so you can see that the, this additional wheel here actually helps with the, to smooth the transition from the vertical to the um, overhead surface. Okay, so for this robot, the magnetic wheel system is designed to be able to en uh, enable the robot to move from one surface to another, it's like Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, and we designed the wheel system, one key selling feature of our robot is um, high payload. Mm -hmm. High payload is important because with, uh, we look at the um, tools, the sensors, the equipment that uh, workers are bringing in to these confined spaces and high heights to actually perform work. Uh, some of these portable equipment can be quite heavy. So high payload is important. And with this high payload characteristic, um, our robot uh, we will be able to, uh, it will be very modular in the sense that um, you, we can easily, because it can take many types of sensors equipment, so we can actually swap out the top of the robot for the uh, equipment sensors required uh, according to the industry uh, that we are looking at. So for example, here um, you can see that um, this robot, here this is the base of the robot, and uh, we can actually reconfigure it for inspection or welding. So now this robot that you see here is actually in the inspection mode. So uh, some key characteristics of this, some key features of this robot um, is that um, so it can be wireless control or it can be pitted. That means there's a wire connected to it. So mm -hmm. for welding, it has to be wired uh, because um, if it's not wired, it has to be running on battery. And uh, it's quite dangerous to have a battery source next to when, when you are doing welding. So, uh, but for other applications whereby, um, for other applications, most of the time, we prefer the robot to be um, wireless. And that's why um, we have the inspection mode wireless configuration. Um, range is um, half a kilometer. Can go within line of sight. Can, we can control it from half a kilometer away. That's very far um, if, if your space is really that big. And uh, for battery-wise, uh, it can last for about four hours. And, um, yeah, so the one at the, the configuration at the bottom is actually on welding. So uh, there are actually, uh, you can see that there's, we have a holder to actually clamp onto the welding torch and the mechanism will mimic the motion of the manual welder to uh, when he does the welding. So, Okay, so I've covered the technology. So now it's more of, uh, so that was actually more of like during the research phase, what we did. And so after the Capital NUS Corporate Lab ended, so what happened was that um, uh, our soup, 
um, asked us whether we wanted to uh, commercialize and spin off a company from it. So we thought that um, it is a good opportunity. And then we look for, at the kind of uh, support given by NUS. We feel that um, there's a lot of um, support given, um, especially for first timers uh, who are starting out to do a business. So we went in under uh, NUS, NUS Enterprise, we, partic we participated in their uh, entrepreneurship uh, programs like the Lean Launchpad. That, uh, so that's uh, our mentor in orange on the left, the picture. And then from Lean Launchpad, we see Lean Launchpad, uh, we were out there to talk to people. We approached many different companies, asked them uh, whether uh, what, what is that? We, we, we look at their problems and see, we ask them whether our robots will help them to solve their problems. So this is what um, is known as market validation. Then <clears throat> after that, we move on to join the GRIP, which is known as the Graduate Research Innovation Program. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, group got, the group got bigger because we have more advisors in the GRIP, including technical advisors, uh, commercial advisors, yeah, so um, when it comes to grip, it's uh, very serious in the sense that um, at the end of the grip, we have to spin off company. It's not like uh, just, it's, it's no longer a school project whereby you talk to people and see oh, whether there's a potential in spinning off. So we have to spin out a company at the end. And that's why we move and we discuss things, for, we take things further into like, we talk about target market, business model, yeah. So the problems that we are focusing on right now, uh, there are, is mainly two main problems. Uh, the first one is ship inspection. So the picture at the top is a ship that uh, is quite a common ship out there. They use it to carry um, like sand, or minerals. Uh, it's quite common out there. You can take a look. You can go to East Coast Park Beach and look at the ships anchored out there. Quite a lot of ships are like that. <coughs> what, uh, so the bottom left picture, that's the picture of the cargo hole of the ship. It's quite deep. Can be about two to three stories, or three to four stories. And um, the picture on the right, that's the ballast tank um, inside the ship. Although it looks like a haunted house, but it's not. Uh, it's, a, it's highly corroded because for this ballast tank, uh, what happens is uh, seawater is pumped in uh, and seawater is sucked out. It's, basically, they use seawater inside these tanks to maintain the control the flotation of the ship. So what happens is for this ship, um, every five years or so, this ship has to go for inspection. It's like cars have to go to the workshop for inspection regularly on a yearly basis. So, and older ships, more than 10 years, you have to do it like every two to three years, which is more frequent. What happens during this inspection is that um, they have to take measurements of, around the entire ship to, to ensure that the structure of the ship is sound. And now they do it manually. And because like the picture on the left is the, it can be, can be confined space and it can be very high locations, heights. So you have to set up a lot of scaffolding and then you have to go into this dangerous confined space to take measurements. So a lot of environment preparation is needed. There's a lot of cost involved. So we have this robot. We hope that this robot um, can help with, to speed up the productivity and safety of this task. So as we are talking now, so this is a article that came out this morning. Unfortunately, an accident happened on, in, in, in uh, one of the ship's ballast tanks. Three workers, they went into the ballast tanks and because of confined space have this atmospheric hazard whereby oxygen uh, concentration can be much, much lower. So as a result, um, the workers died inside. So this is actually a very real problem out there that uh, we are trying to solve. So we're also looking at um, using this robot for um, cleaning, kitchen duct cleaning. So 
like this picture here, you can see this ki kitchen ducts, uh, you will probably see it outside near F&B outlets. It's a regulatory requirement. It's required to have kitchen ducts to uh, exhaust out the kitchen fumes into the air. And over time, grease will collect in these ducts. And if nothing is done to maintain, kitchen ducts fire will occur. So I have some articles. It's quite common, actually, kitchen ducts fire. Last year, <coughs> in September, <coughs> there was a kitchen duct fire at Orchard Hotel. And over there, um, just this year in March, uh, one of the kitchen duct in, at the Kiong Baru coffee shop caught fire. And right now, what they do is they really send workers like this climb into the ducts to do the cleaning. So, uh, <clears throat> and vertical ducts are almost impossible to clean. Can, can you imagine the workers having to climb up the vertical ducts or to ha actually have to like be laid down from the top? It's very fragile. It's a very difficult job. Mm. So we are hoping that this robot uh, can help out in this uh, kitchen duct maintenance as well. So, yeah, the, uh, this is our robot. Uh, we are, it's a, we, we are de developing it, designing it as a platform technology, modular, like a Spider-Man, able to go from horizontal to vertical to overhead surface, can carry a high payload so that um, we can carry various sensors and equipment to suit the needs of multiple industries such as offshore, petrochem, construction industry, but for now, we are focusing on the marine time inspection and environmental cleaning. Okay. All right. Yeah, so uh, if you are interested to find out more about us, you can visit us at our website, www.richbox.sg. Okay. Thanks, Yen Zhi, <coughs> right? And then for the very comprehensive overview, mm. and of course, the last minute uh, context mm. advertisement, okay? Now, maybe you want to... Uh, have a drink, right? Yeah, I can see that you spend a lot of energy. Okay, so um, we, are, we are going to um, have a brief chat. And uh, the formula is going to find uh, is STEM education, the education itself, the STEM uh, innovation. And, and you heard a lot about it, the sciences behind it. And then after that, the entrepreneurship. So uh, we're going to go into details in a, in a chit chat format, okay? Now, uh, first, let's, before we start, right, I think you and me has quite a lot in common. Huh? Uh, he's in uh, Singapore Youth Flying Club, right? Yeah. What do you do? Making model aeroplanes. Making model, do you fly it? Yes, uh, we fly the models. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, I'm much older. I don't belong to the <laughs> Singapore Youth Flying Club, but I belong to the Junior Flying Club. Not that I'm, not that I'm junior, but when I was 18 years old, studying, mm. and uh, the, the Junior Flying Club or the JFC is the uh, it's a predecessor to the Singapore Youth Flying Club, right? Mm. So they renamed it. I came probably in the 1990s, mm. and and I was actually flying the plane, right? So uh, so we have common interest in aviation. Um, so uh, so the, the 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 question is, let's start with aviation, right? Since mm. common interest. So why why the interest in aviation, and what you really need to do uh, in order to understand aerospace, you know? Okay, um, so looking at planes since young, I always feel very, it's, it's, it, every time a plane takes off, if you go really up close, it really looks like a miracle. Like, how is it possible that something which is like so massive, so uh -huh. heavy can actually take yeah. off? It's a heavy object taking off, all right? Yeah, so it's that's, just like a drone, right? Heavy impressive. object taking yeah. off, yes. So what's the science principle? Science principle is uh, f fluid dynamics okay. that generates the lift, yes, that so that uh, it has enough force to take the plane up. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like uh, so when the plane is slow, mm -hmm. um, it's like uh, so the air around it is like the air around us. Yeah. But when the plane picks up speed, and because of the way it's designed to be uh, streamlined, yes, um, the fluid around it actually feels like, it becomes more like uh, us swimming in the swimming pool. Uh -huh, that uh -huh. kind of feeling yeah. that actually provides the lift for the plane to go up. So, uh, yeah, a plane should always go at high speed because it's more stable at high speed. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so, so the, the, the interesting is the science, right? The science is uh, what I call 
or what not our core, right? But it's the monolith principle, mm. where it's much more fluid dynamics, where where the flow, the flow at the bottom and the and the upper part of the wing, uh, uh, create a lift, right? So so that is just sort of lift it up. Mm. So that's science, right? If you don't understand science, you just need to dream, but then it won't fly. But if you know the science, then you can design why the wings are designed this way. And people now they say, hey, why there's a this at the end of wing there's a winglet? What is it for? But they're all sciences, right? Which which we understand from mm. mathematics and all this simulation, and that's very important for us to, to actually uh, uh, design and come up with uh, fantastic, amazing stuff, right? That what uh, Yin Tzu has, uh, has worked on. Now, um, so you talk about visiting, I think, Polytechnic? Yeah. Which Polytechnic? Um, I visited a few, so oh, like oh, Singapore few. Okay. Polytechnic yeah. uh, and uh, Nanyang Polytechnic, Amokyo, okay. yes. Right. I did and, visit and, and, a few. How they brainwash you? Uh, we went. We got to see their projects. Oh, okay. So, so, so you're brainwashed by oh, this thing that works, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and that's still your interest. Yes. But but inherently, you 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 always want to do this. You always want to study engineering or science. Inherently, um, I was fascinated by those. Uh, I like playing with those models when yeah, I was okay. really young. Yeah. So I was like fascinated by those models, and then. Um, for science, uh, just somehow I feel that something that uh, I can appreciate uh, and I like it and I like to uh, know more about how things work. So you can put the science, you can see the sciences being actually implemented in the real world. Yes. Right? That's important, right? Yeah. It's not just going to the labs and just conduct experiments and then just forget about it, right? But it's re real application. No, we're not talking about brainwash, right? Use the wrong word. Actually, how you generate awareness and interest. And I mean, it happened to me, right? When I was finished, before I finished my O-level, I, I went to visit Singapore Poly. There are not many polys then, right? But then, yeah, so I visit Singapore Poly and they was say, oh, this automation, this equipment moving around. And I was like, oh, good. That's very interesting, right? But, but let's go and study, right? How to actually do it. This is yeah. pneumatics and the electronics controls. Mm. Fascinating because you can really turn nothing into something. You can turn dream into reality. And that's the power of science and all the STEM education that provides you. Now let's move on. So wh why a PhD? Because sounds very good, you're called doctor. <laughs> um, it's mainly the, one, one thing is the interest. Mm -hmm. And then um, my supervisor back then during my uh, final year project, so when you do a degree, at the end of the day, you have to do a final year project before you can graduate. So after I did my final project, uh, my supervisor uh, encouraged me to uh, further my studies and do a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, because it really trains you uh, more in the sense that... Uh, actually, back then when I was about to graduate, I really got... It was a bit of this feeling like... Um, also, that's the end. So. I'm not an engineer. I go and do like yeah, yeah. do some real development and designing. Okay. Am I ready for it? But actually, now I know that actually when you go out, there's a lot of on-job training. Mm -hmm. But uh, so doing a PhD actually allows me to um, pick up more of this. Uh, it's really going deeper into the fundamentals behind mm. engineering. Mm. So at the end of the day, when you come out. Somehow, I feel that it gives you a more a, a kind of feeling whereby uh, it's like there's there's nothing, there's nothing, there's really nothing that you, you can't achieve in engineering if you want to do it, mm -hmm. unless you are limited by the physical principles. <laughs> so it gives you that kind of a courage, more of a courage. This is what I feel personally. Yeah. So so for example, right? A, a mm. lot of people say, okay, PhD very very tough, right? Yeah, but uh, you still you still is, is it very tough? <laughs> Uh, yes, you got to be tough, right? Yeah, yeah. to be tough. Yeah, huh? but but what's the important thing, right? Is it is it the discovery of new thing, or is it the uh, the training of the mind? I think it's the training of the mind. The training of the mind. Of course, so it's good yes, to discover yeah. new things, but uh, if you have to discover new things, but actually more of like I would say that the more the the it's like a life skill to take away from this right. whole training is, is really the uh, training of the mind that is very valuable. Which means that, which means that uh, obviously we, 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 all, we know that the PhD is that you are very specialized in this area. 
but because you have this training of the mind yep. and uh, can systematically think, can creatively, mm. so PhD a lot about creativity, right? Yep. A lot of people say, where's the creativity PhD? But they have to create new stuff, right? Mm. And new knowledge. And therefore, that training of the mind is very important. And this allows you to actually move to different places, yes. right? Because you just need to acquire the technical knowledge. Yep. And then your mind uh, you know, allow you to facilitate that. That's, mm. that's, now, for people who are not initiated, you know, this, this is really interesting, right? That the PhD is the training of the mind, right? Now, but you are, you are very, uh, you, know, you listen to uh, your, your supervisor a lot, right? So you do a PhD. <laughs> now, I didn't listen to my, my, my final year project supervisor. Uh, when I finished my degree and he was like, you know, my bachelor, and he was like, you know, do you want to do a PhD? I was like, uh, but I already got a scholarship to uh, do a, you know, that time networking, uh, data soft, data networking, or, and software engineering. I already got a scholarship to do postgraduate study, so I, I didn't take up my, my PhD then. But finally, I finished my doctorate. But that's another story. <laughs> okay, now, so, so we, we, we passed that education part. That, no, the, so STEM, STEM education, uh, all PhD give you training on the mind, but STEM education, give you that extra boost, right? Because mm. now you can really apply your knowledge to create new stuff, mm. all right? And when we, we say that now, scientists, scientists start, studies the nature, magnetism, but engineer creates that never exists, mm. right? Yeah, so you study magnetism, but you create something that can climb, a, climb up the, uh, uh, a ship, right? Or a tanker. Okay, great. So, so we cover the, uh, the education part of it. Now, I would like to encourage everybody to, uh, uh, to ask questions. Uh, later part, we have a Q&A session. So you can actually send your questions to chat room and uh, various means. And uh, today, we're like slightly different. So if you ask a question, we'll ask you, uh, we ask you for maybe PM us your, on, the, on the chat room a personal message uh, about your address. Because we're going to give you this, this thing, this thing called keychain, right? This keychain called remove before flight. Right, oh. as new aeronautics, it's a nice key change. So if you provide us the address in Singapore, of course, then we send it to you. Overseas, <laughs> a bit difficult now. All right, so do get the questions coming. Now let's move on from education to innovation, right? Mm. So, so the PhD uh, come up with new knowledge, new applications, mm. and and therefore uh, come come to this this uh, robots, right? So uh, you consider this advanced robotics. Oh yeah. Yes, it's called advanced robotics. So it's called deep technology. Mm. Now, uh, in terms of innovation, what's the most important thing to come up with a new idea? Mm, the most important thing to come up with a new idea, uh, I guess, is to really keep an open mind. Keep an open mind, right? Okay. But mm. I think the, the first thing, right, let's say empathy. Yesterday we talked about empathy. Yeah. So empathy means trying to understand the customer needs, right? So mm. when you understand the customer needs, at the end, you will have a problem to solve, right? Yes. And especially it's a tough problem, mm. a challenging problem. And, and that is, a, or sometimes in design thinker, thinking, right? We call it the wicked problem. The world has a lot of wicked problems. The biggest problem is called climate change, right? But <laughs> we, we can't solve climate change, right? We've got to decompose it to yeah. smaller, smaller problem. But it's very important because the purpose is, is, is really, really important. And mm. I, I want to follow up on Ian uh, um, just now that slides on, on the Straits Times. And, and he and me, I don't know why he reads Straits Times because nowadays people <laughs> don't read newspaper. I mean, physical newspaper. I'm the old generation. I still read physical newspapers. <laughs> and uh, so this is really, really the, the paper, is it? Supervisor. Supervisor worker die after collapsing in ship's tanks, and, and as Ian Tzu has said that this is because people, uh, the, the three guys that goes in there very fast, right? They, they collapse and because of lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's, uh, it's really a disaster, right? Because we lost life just like that. And, and what we really need to do is that this purpose, right? Because uh, the problem of working in a ship, right? Mm -hmm. In the confined environment, going for inspection, and this, this is about inspection, is that we don't know what it is. Should we send a human in there, right? I mean, maybe the present practice will send a human, but what are other solutions, mm. right? So the problem definitions become critical. 
So maybe you want to, so there's a higher purpose, but the solution is you've got to brainstorm a solution, right? Yeah. So how does this, how do you actually come up to these machines that can actually solve the problems mm. of uh, not letting human into a toxic environment? Yeah. So actually, <coughs> um, in problem solving, uh, of course, so to come up with a solution, often we have to really go down into the very fundamentals and understand the fundamentals behind the mm -hmm. problem. That's very important. And I feel that one way is that, um, yeah, after going down into the fundamentals, um, we, and that, that's where after that the uh, open mind comes about, as in we are not we shouldn't be fixated uh, with uh, current tools or current approaches how are things uh, supposed to be done so that kinds of like uh, so that uh, there will be more possibilities of so course, may, I, may I put it rephrase it right yeah. so you look at a horse do, to solve the problem you get a better horse then no car will be invented yeah. in that sense you yeah. could throw away our old mentality yes. right yes. let's cause a disruption yeah carry on so because what like it, for Prof Neil's example, what, what is the purpose? The main purpose is to get from point A to point B. I don't care whether I use a horse, I use a car, or I fly there. The problem is to get from point A to point B. That's interesting because the problem definition is very important. <laughs> yes. right? if, you, if you define the, uh, I need to go faster with a horse, then you will get a yeah. faster breed horse. Yeah. So, but, but really, the fundamental problem is point A to point B. Yes. Travel from point A to yes. point B. Great, carry on. So for example, in our case, we, so, um, the, the problem to be solved is to be able to climb up the walls and the ceilings. There are many ways of climbing. You can use magnets. Mm -hmm. You can use uh, suction, or mm -hmm. suction cups. Uh, suction cups may not be powerful enough, so we can have a vacuum pump to actually pump out the air so mm -hmm. that it can stay on to the uh, wall. So we look at the, the various approach and back then we thought that, uh, okay, our problem is more of um, inside the ship, how where everything is uh, ferrous matter. So the problem with suction cup is that it wouldn't provide us with the uh, payload, the weight. It wouldn't meet the weight requirement. Mm -hmm. And for <clears throat> the vacuum pump approach, uh, it, it's, it may work, but it's a bit complex and we are worried about debris because it's a dirty environment. Yeah. So we are worried about debris uh, damaging the system. So that's why um, we went with magnets. Mm -hmm. And so we have to design the magnetic wheel system. So of course, first we started with one wheel, with the one wheel magnet, the robot. Very first version, we stick on the wall, can climb, can go up, we were very happy. <laughs> then slowly we build up into two wheels. So two wheels, two wheels, how are you going to turn the robot? Yeah, these are the sum of considerations that we were right. looking at. Like, yeah. do we have a steering system like the car? Mm -hmm. Or do we just uh, power the wheels in reverse direction so that this is what we call differential mm. steering. So um, the car's way of steering is uh, too complicated and it doesn't provide us a, a tight turning radius. Like, so our robot here is able to actually turn on the spot. So that's why we opt. So with two wheels, we opt for this uh, differential drive system. And then uh, differential drive system, we added on a third wheel. So should we add? Three wheels or four wheels? So that is also the question. So um, our objective, the problem is we want it to turn on the spot. So based on this problem, we come up with this three wheel at the base concept. And um, the last wheel at the bottom is actually, um, it's actually what we call a omnidirectional wheel. Mm -hmm. So it allows the wheels to turn in different directions without a swivel component. Mm -hmm. So uh, this kinds of like uh, eradicates, uh, eliminates the need for an additional component. So we got the base, we tested a few times. Of course, the robot dropped a few times <laughs> during transition. So that, that's another problem. So step by step, so right. the problem start to come out. So we saw that, uh, so the critical point is uh, from um, when it's trying to climb from the wall to the ceiling, so there's a problem out there, and uh, that's like the critical moment whereby the robot is unstable, and that's why uh, we came up with uh, this uh, design of adding an additional wheel at the top mm -hmm. to allow the robot to um, 
smoothly transit uh, to the ceiling mm. while carrying a high payload. Okay, so, yeah. so it's very interesting, right? So you, uh, so you have experimented, you prototype, and you test it, right? And then yeah. you go through all these various options and retest, yeah. redesign. So we have a methodology for that, actually. So it's, I don't know if, if you are familiar with design thinking, right? It's empathy, trying to say, okay, uh, somebody died, so there's a big issue to solve. Then you define the problem, what are you trying to solve? Maybe uh, to, not to send human in, okay? So that's the problem definition or define. And then, then we need to ideate, right? We need to brainstorm and that's how we come up. Maybe the first unit mm. and phase three, ideate. Empathy, define, ideate, and then after you ideate, do what? Prototype, right? And prototype test, ideate, prototype test. So it's a, it's a big iterations and what uh, Yen Zhu has mentioned is that whole process of design thinking methodology that uh, you know, you all learned, you have heard of, it become the cliche nowadays, it, you know, that the buzzword nowadays, but actually how you apply in the real world, this is how it's, it's being done. Okay, so let's move on from the innovation part and then goes into the commercialization part, right? So the interesting things is a lot of research, a lot of innovation or I won't say innovation because in innovation we have customers or problems to solve. A lot of people come up with just an idea yeah. and it's called invention. You can invent anything, but not necessarily solving a problem, yes. right? So, so there's a difference between in invention and innovation. Invention, coming out with new things. Innovation, solving a problem for customers. So, but then we have one problem, right? Which is identifiable, right? Mm. How do you actually manage to figure out or discover that, you know, the FMB, the, 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 the fumer shoot also is a problem. I say ever cross your mind? When at the start of the, pro so just now I mentioned mm. I joined two programs, LP and GRIP. So LP was the first one. So at the start when we joined, we never even dream of using this robot for those ducks out there. It was uh, just like one of the interviews. Uh, we were talking to, uh, we, are we are actually at Changi Airport Group. Okay, we were talking to one of the uh, uh, managers there. So to, to think of uh, this robot, uh, is there any use in the airport or not? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you literally bring them and say, okay, find me a usage. <laughs> yeah. So we, we were really like, initially when our mentor set up, up the meeting with the airport, we were like, ah, go airport. Uh, is there any use for this airport? But we will just get an open mind and uh, went along and to see what possibilities there are. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I was looking up at the fossil ceiling and I noticed that eh, there are ducks. <laughs> and somehow I just uh, got this uh, thinking that hey, maybe we can apply this robot uh, to the ducks. Okay. So, uh, so it's also a good thing that uh, actually that back then our mentor was in the construction industry. Uh -huh. So he knows more about ducks. Uh -huh. So first thing is we want to apply this to the ducks. So the first question that we ask is what material are the ducks made of? If it's non ferrous we can't apply this robot yeah. to the right. duck because uh, it has to be ferrous material. So we went on to study more about ducks and realized that uh, most of the ducks out there, they are made of uh, galvanized iron. Uh -huh. So mainly galvanized iron is a ferrous uh, material. It's just that it has a thin layer of additional coating on top uh, so that uh, it doesn't rust that easily. Yeah, so uh, that's why we, that's how we came up with this. So do, do you call this a serendipity process? Uh, or is it an engineering mind working? I would say it's more of serendipity process. Okay, serendipity, <laughs> right. But I, 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 I beg to differ. <laughs> I think it's an engineering mind working. So a lot of people uh, things that everything is serendipity, but we we need to know have a science behind it, right? So, so, but why is it serendipity to you? But actually, you go through the process, right? Mm. So when you go through the lean launchpad program or the lean methodology, is what we call customer discovery process, of which I teach you, like, mm. yeah. So, so the the whole purpose of customer discovery is to is to discover is to go into the world and try to understand uh, what are the problems they are facing and they have these ducks and, and, and they need to clean it once a year else it become a fire hazard all right then you ask like okay is there a usage for my machine and mm -hmm. that's where you start thinking right mm -hmm. the serendipity is you saw it and you think it happens but if you never for, go through the customer discovery process the serendipity is not going to exist and I, I basically what I'm trying to say is 
luck is always there. You just need to discover the luck. So it's called customer discovery process, which is part of our lean methodology. So, so in that in that sense, what Intu has done is that he he looks at this and say, where are the opportunities? And then he say, and then you have to find, can it be done? The science behind it, right? Mm. When he first come to me, I was like, you sure? I thought those are aluminum darts, you know, it's, there's no iron content, how does magnetism going to work on aluminum? And I was like, no, 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 it's just one layer, the inside are all iron. I was like, oh, okay, then the science works, okay? And I think that's where, right, you look at opportunities, you look at problem definition, and then say, oh, yeah, the science works, and then the rest is, well, how big is this market? So, mm. how big is this market? Is it worth your time to investigate this application? Um, for a start, yes. Yeah. Although uh, the marine time industry is way bigger market, which mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, focusing on as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so you think because there's regulation, right? So yeah, no choice. Yes. So somebody really need to clean that part, mm. and uh, I, I can't imagine people like me, maybe him, people like me, <laughs> going inside that duck. Yeah, and they actually have to get a smaller. They actually, when we talk to those companies out there, they say, "Oh, to go up, uh, we will choose the one which is lightest and thinnest to go in." So if you don't, if you don't break your breakfast, <laughs> you get a job. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. But let's talk about the the the, the shipping industry, right? Mm. So why why you say it is a, a a big opportunity, right? I mean, uh, this machine is mm. built basically for that purpose. Yeah. So how do you actually compute? Um, because in the marine time industry, uh, time is money. Um, when the ship owner sends in the ship for um, the regular survey inspection, it's, it's like when you send, when, you're, when, when a person sends his car to the workshop for servicing, mm. he don't get to use the car. So it's an inconvenience to him. For the ship, it sends it in for inspection, it's going to cost him for oil tanker around thirty to forty thousand a day. Okay, that's a lot of money involved. Mm. So the the inspection process can take up to from a week to if for older ships can up to three to four weeks. So imagine the amount of cost incurred, and on top of this, um, when the company goes in to do this work, the inspection fee isn't cheap. Why? Because they have to set up the environment, their hazards, they have to clear out the hazards. There are tall places which the workers cannot reach, the inspection engineers cannot reach. They have to set up all this scaffolding, they have to try to find means and ways to reach to the points to collect the data. So, end up um, the entire um, inspection process plus the um, <clears throat> loss of income for the ship owners, it can easily add up to a few million dollars. Okay. And that is why we look at this, it's a big market and there are so many ships out there and that's why uh, we are uh, focusing on this market. So that's very interesting, right? So you have a machine that, uh, that is, uh, can save money for inspection, mm. uh, save a lot of money though. Uh, but I think the more important thing is that we want to make an impact on the world is that we receive life. Mm. Life, safe is invaluable, right? Yeah, life is priceless. And in the meantime, we, we, we save you money. Yep. Isn't that a very good proposition, right? Okay, good. So now Q&A time. I mean, instead of me asking you questions, may, uh, may we then just look at who, who are asking questions, right? Remember, if you ask the questions, you know, PM us your uh, address or email first. PM us your email and then we'll, we'll, we'll get this to you. All right, first question. May I know to what extent can we automate the construction industry? Ah, now you've got a tough job. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so this is actually really a tough job. That uh, even in the robotics field, uh, you see some construction robots, one or two robots out there. Uh, mainly why it is difficult to, as of now with current technology, why it is difficult to automate the industry is because uh, the environment is very unstructured, yeah. dynamic changing, ever changing, and even robot moving around sometimes can be a problem because um, there might be uh, piles of uh, construction materials or debris up there and block, the robot cannot go over, whereas the worker can sometimes just easily cross over. So, uh, 
I would say that we will have to take small steps mm. towards automating um, the construction industry. Mm -hmm. mm. It will, we will not get there tomorrow, but, uh, we, but we will need to take small steps towards it. Um, if, if you were, I, I, can't, I can't actually give a number, mm. but I would guess that um, we, what, what we can do is um, we, we, we look at the limitations of the robots construction industry. So one way to increase adoption of uh, automation is actually to see how we can uh, change things, how, are, yeah. how things yeah, yeah, are done yeah, in construction. Yeah. So that will also help. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, con construction industry, a lot of concrete. Yeah. This is, you know, you need, you need, you need ferrous material, right? You so maybe, maybe of instead of, of adapting this to the, the, the building, maybe the building should have, con should have more metal. <laughs> or design the building so that yeah. it's two streets of metal and then you can go up. But obviously, obviously, what we can also do is explore other technologies to be integrated that can uh, somehow maybe like Spider-Man spike, climb up the concrete wall. Uh, but that will be another interdisciplinary research, right? So yes. if you want to do a PhD, I think that's great. Yeah. But uh, something to integrate. Okay, let's next next question. All right. So next question. Could you share biggest challenge? Wow. Okay. Um it's all about money, is it? <laughs> okay, the obvious, the obvious would be money. Okay, that's the most challenging thing because uh, without money, money is like oxygen. That's what our mentor taught us. No money, there's nothing to talk about. Right. Uh, I would say that uh, the biggest challenge would be uh, getting them because it's uh, something new. Is when it's something new come out, people are always hesitant to try it to use it. So to find customers who are willing. To, find, to, to have the market for a product, to find customers who are willing to adopt your solution, um, that is, I would say, the biggest challenge. Yeah. You can build something which is very fancy, full, very nice, very high tech, but if you can't convince people to use it, people don't want to use it, you, you can't make money out of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think in the venture capital world or in the funding world, right, we always, la, those guys have money, you know, control a lot of money and say, money is never a problem unless you have a good solution. But guys, seriously, money is a problem. <laughs> but, but I think the important thing is you have must have the passion. Mm. So what we really look at is people who, who can see it through, right? Not because, you know, when, when you are on a technopreneurship kind of environment, right? You will start and you get down, 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 down before it comes up, right? So you must see yourself through, right? Mm. Because you see yourself through and then it brings up. Now, which which, uh, which so-called technopreneur never see the downside before I see the upside? Which, they, which one they won't see the upside, right? You talk about Alibaba, they so down, 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 and then it comes up, right? Like, yeah, you look at uh, uh, Steve Jobs, right? Up, and then down, down, and then it comes up. So I think the passion is very important. What you believe in, and then can make the world a better place that drives you the motivation, okay? Great, let's move on to the next question then. Well, this is technical. <laughs> <laughs> Would video latency issues possibly affect your operations? You know, I think the answer mm. is anything you're not sure, just say AI <laughs> in this world. Okay. Um, of course, video latency will, cause, will, will affect the operations because let's say, but this is only true if it's manually controlled by an uh, operator. That means the operator will have to, based on the video feedback, control the robot at all times. So we right. have to make sure that that link is uh, reliable, is, uh, robust. So uh, what we plan to do is to build some autonomy onto this robot so that with autonomy, the robot, without human control, the robot will be able to move around its own, find its way. So with autonomy in that sense, even let's say we have some uh, video latency issues in between, it's okay because the robot knows how, knows what to do. Yeah. Okay. This is what we are uh, working to. All right, great. Now it's 11.59. I don't think we want to go to another question, but keep your questions coming with your email. Uh, private Confidential will probably get uh, into to answer your questions, okay? And remember this, all right? So email is very important. All right, so uh, maybe uh, we talk about the next speaker, okay? Because uh, tomorrow is going to be a holiday in Singapore, so I'm not going to work, all right? So everybody take a break, okay? So Thursday, Thursday coming. Right, so Thursday, who is going to be our guest speaker? All right, if you look at the screen, 
the my guest speaker is Tada Yap Hong Kai. So Dr. Yap is co-founder and CTO of Processo. What is Processo? Well, we're gonna help help people to recover recuperate from strokes. That's fascinating, right? We are going to make the world a better place, just like have Tian Tzu has done, right? Okay, so you stay tuned for Thursday, 11 a.m. And now, let's go to the advertisement. The next slides will be very critical and exciting. So the next slide is on Jeff Williams. Yesterday I mentioned it, right? Jeff is an astronaut, NASA, and he's going to come on live and answer your questions within that hour about the training of astronauts, the quality, the attributes, you know, and the experience of in a, being in a space shuttle, in a Soyuz capsule, in the International Space Station, and doing space walk. All right? Not the moonwalk, but the space walk, the real space walk. So, 1st July 2021, all right, first, first week, first week, I think it's on the Thursday, 9 p.m. Why 9 p.m.? Why not 8 p.m.? Because Jeff is beaming live from U.S. So we have to take care of time's difference. All right? And uh, so do sign up. Uh, there's a, it's very simple, tinyurl.com at Astros 2021 and you get to see the astronaut live in action. Unfortunately, we cannot back get him to come in Singapore, though he's supposed to be in Singapore. <laughs> We make do, we make do, right? So thank you very much, Yin Tzu, and great to see all of you. And Thursday, another round of Aspire with Prof Neo. Bye, thank you.